girl. I'm good. How are you? Well, I'm very hot because I can't have the AC on while we're doing this because it makes too much sound in my hotel room. Ooh. My wig is sliding back and I... <laughs> I literally saw your Instagram story too, where you were like, how? <laughs> That's the question for me too, though. Cause I literally am so confused how they keep the wigs on. Like I see people swimming with wigs. I'm like, what kind of super glue have you got on to be able to yes. do that? I'm done. <laughs> I'm bloody done. I get so confused. Welcome to Role Model with me, Leomi Anderson where I sit down with some of the biggest change makers and stars and break down what it really took to be called a role model. In a world that only shows the final glossy product and projects perfection, role model is all about getting to the heart of what shaped these individuals. And today we hear from a girl who to me is a triple threat. Not just a singer, she's also an actress and a dancer, and in my opinion, an absolute superstar. We're going to hear about her tales of colorism. And it was like people that I would date that were like just embarrassed to like say that they were dating me. And I was just be like, well, I don't understand. Managing those sex scenes in store. I don't know who this is and this is just awkward. And I'm like half naked and then there's like a whole crew of men behind the camera and I'm just like, this is so weird. And she reveals the story about when she met her boo, actor and model Keith Powers. I don't even think I've ever said that um, anywhere. It's the beautiful Ryan Destiny. I'm so excited to have you on because I have watched your journey. I think you're amazing. I think you're super inspiring. And I think that it's time for people to get to know the, the nitty gritty of uh, what makes Ryan Destiny the role model that she is. But I thought we would start from the, you know, from the very beginning. I know obviously your dad was part of an R&B group called Guess. Yeah. So you've always had the music industry around you. Yeah. But did you always aspire to be a part of it or was it something that you just loved being around? Um, I definitely loved being around it. And I think since my dad was always in that world. I just naturally, I don't know. I just went into it. Like my dad was always singing, singing around the house and the bug just bit me too, I guess. And I'm just like, <laughs> all I can remember is ever since I was really young, just loving to watch musicals and movies and be able to like sing along with them and, mm -hmm. you know, do the lines as well. Like I was just like super into just all of it. Me too, but my voice, uh, not that great. <laughs> so <laughs> what's your earliest memory that you have of music? I think it's probably me being in the studio with my dad. I was maybe like three or something. I was like super young. So I, I remember it so vaguely. I don't even, I just remember like where I was and like the space. But yeah, my memory is actually like shot. Like it's really terrible. So the fact that I remember that is crazy. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I don't even remember what I did last week, let alone three <laughs> years old. Like bloody hell, that's a very good memory. But obviously that means that it's something that was very important to you. Even if you don't remember all the details, it obviously means a lot to you, which is, which is really beautiful. You have been in several different girl groups with your first one when you were 12 years old. So just talk me through how this all came about because I too was in a girl band when I was uh, around nine years old. Uh, weren't very good. Were you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I think that like all girls were in a girl group at some point in their lives. Like <laughs> it happened at some point. I just really loved girl groups growing up. Like I loved TLC, mm. I loved Destiny's Child. Like I was so infatuated with them. And um, I loved like the camaraderie too. Like just like being like with your girls and being able to do what you guys both like. So it was definitely like a school thing. Like I went to school with the girls and we would just like get together and get creative, start singing together, making harmonies, all this type of stuff. And yeah, it just like formed into this like real thing, I guess, and continued on a little too long than what I would have liked it to, but it, it, <laughs> it continued. <laughs> what do you mean by that? 
Come on, give me the juice now. You know, I really just think that I was holding on to this dream when it was just not working. Like, I just, I, I think at the end of the day, we were all very young. So it was just like drama that would happen. And like, you know, like he said, she said stuff and people trying to get in to each other's ears and like just a lot of like crap you know and being young you're kind of like preyed upon as well in like the music industry and people like see that vulnerability and you know it's you being naive too and they spot it and they take advantage of it and I think that that's what happened to all of us and unfortunately it made a lot of us not really bond the best way and um but I really do like I mean I'm just like reflecting on it now and I really, you know, wish the best for them, honestly. And I'm just hoping that we all learn from it and grew from it. And I definitely think I did. So I'm just hoping the same for them. Um, One of the girls I'm still like really close with, like we're best friends. Um, But yeah, it's some people that I haven't spoken to in like a long time, but you know, it's all love and I just really, don't put anything like against anyone I think it was just like a weird vulnerable time you know and being that young we're completely different people now so (laughs) it's different (laughs) I know for a fact that you were on America's Got Talent sorry I'm taking it back actually you are I wanted to talk about this yes because recently a lot of people um who were on like the UK version of X Factor and stuff like that previous contestants have come forward saying how they didn't like how they were treated and stuff like that and I know that you guys decided to come off of the show so I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit if you don't mind yeah it's sort of weird because it's like such a far memory in the back of my brain where it's sometimes I forget little things here and there but we weren't on there for like a super long time we were just on there until they were like okay we have to sign you guys now and that's how that's the only way you'll be able to move on to the next like stage oh really yeah really I didn't know it was like that yeah and so then like our parents our parents all three of my parents got involved Mm. and they just were not liking it. Like it was like, they were trying to hold us for like, I want to say like 10 years. Like it was like a crazy number. And I was just like, even at that age, I was like, you know what? That's probably not worth it. Like it was like the weirdest contract. And it was just like, just no. I think that year was actually the year Kalani and her group was on. We were going to be, oh, like, all on, like, the same season. That's crazy. And, yeah, I remember, <laughs> I remember like, rooting for her and her group because um, I just thought they were, they were super cool. But, yeah, that was, that was a fun time. It was, it was interesting, very entertaining. Yeah. Like, the judges and everything were, like, very, like, I think the crowd, crowd's reaction and stuff was, like, fake, like, it was just like heightened. Everything was heightened. It was like so. I was just like, this is weird. Like, the crowd goes wild. Ah. And really it's like, ah. Yes. <laughs> Literally, like everything was so, it was like just all for TV. And I was just like, whatever. This is, is what it is. But um, it was funny. <laughs> Very interesting experience, it sounds like. Yes. I guess you're fortunate because, as you said, you get kind of preyed on in the industry. It's a space that is, it's just like modeling, like being a young woman in any of these industries, people are looking to flip in, prey on you, play mind tricks, manipulate you. But you had your mum there, like that is so fortunate. And obviously there's so many different like troops and stereotypes of what a a momager is like. So talk to me about yours and your mum's relationship. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely had its ups and downs. Um, I just feel like, you know, being a a mom and daughter duo, period, you're going to just, like, go through things, like, especially, like, teen years. And and that's, like, when I was, like, growing, figuring stuff out, you know. So we bumped heads a lot, but I definitely think we're at a better place now in, in general. And luckily, we're able to split the two of like when it's mom time and when it's manager time you know um thankfully 
So it's just kind of keeping that balance, you know, and I, and I, it is a stereotype with momagers, but I think at the end of the day, it's because of how much they protect you. And it like makes people almost upset, you know, it's like they know that they can't get past you with certain things because they can't get past her because she knows, like, knows the intentions, knows like what's going on for real. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. And it's, it's nice to be able to trust someone because it's obviously hard to. What would you say is one of the things that your mum protected you from the most in the industry? Because I actually spoke to Michelle Williams and she said that having Beyonce's parents and her parents close by protected her from like the, the hypersexualization of the industry, etc. So what would you say is one of the things that you're thankful your mum was 100% there for? I think definitely like that's a great example. I feel like men, especially, there's so many men <laughs> in the industry mm, nasty smelly ass men yeah like their yeah their intentions are not great all the time and especially i think you know when it is like a younger girl who is obviously like we just talked about like just like sort of naive and just like really like wanting to make it and, and like desperate and they like spot that and so they just like are like yes i, I got her in now and it's I see it happen and it's it's really it's really sad how much it happens but luckily I think things are like changing and when your parents are around you period I just think that they know that they can't get away with it and it's not going to be pretty at all if they even like try you in any way so I definitely think the this the men being protected from the men in the industry cuz I'm going in the studios with these men and I'm going to like meetings with these men and like, it's just so many like intimate moments where you have and it's weird to do that alone. I'd be so scared. I'd be scared to go into the studio with a guy. Obviously my boyfriend's a, a rapper as well. Even I feel uncomfortable sometimes going to the studio when there's loads of his boys there and like mm -hmm. I'm a grown ass woman. So I can't even imagine like being young, right. you know, you want to obviously show your talents, but you also don't want to be in a situation where things can go very left. and. Men just make me sick sometimes, Ryan. I swear. I know. Oh my day. <laughs> it's really, it's really annoying because they really are gross. It's like they can be great sometimes, you know, but they're like gross overall. So it's just like. Yeah. <laughs> Saying that obviously some are good. Is there any situations where you kind of wish your mom wasn't there? Like maybe like an event, a party, you see a cute guy, or you see you know something going on. Your mom's just there, like because there's obviously sometimes where I'm happy that my mom weren't there because you know I was just living my life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> no for sure I feel like it was weird because I feel like the transition of me just growing up um in general was a process for her as well um luckily she was for the most part chill with everything like my mom would go to the club with like us sometimes and my mom she also looks younger so it's easy for it to not be like a thing where people are like is that her mom so they're normally like mistaking her for somebody else but it was like it was weird we literally would go to the club and then it would just be a thing like i think she was with me she was actually with me when i met keith actually um oh. <laughs> yes she was literally with me i don't even think i've ever said that um <laughs> anywhere but yeah she was she was actually with me it was like a party and um she was probably with me the next time I saw him. Like, it's, like, very, like, chill. Like, I, I don't really, like, care like that. It's obviously been times where I'm like, all right, I'm out. I'm going somewhere. Or, like, all right, <laughs> you know, somebody's coming into town. Like, I don't really need you coming over and visiting, like, around this time. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, sometimes it's happening. For sure, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're from Detroit, Michigan, but yes. you moved. Uh, what age did you move to LA then? And what was that transition like for you? So it was weird because I got signed in my senior year of high school. That's like 17, 17, 18. So from that time, I had been going back and forth to LA for like, like long periods of time, like months at a time. Um, so it sort of felt like I had been here for a minute, but officially... 
in 2019, I think, is when I officially made the move, like, okay, I'm here. Would you say that you feel that LA is fake or hard to navigate? Because that's like a stereotype of LA, but I haven't lived there, right. so I don't really know. Like, I think that New York is dumb fake. Like, Ooh. everyone's like, how are you? Mwah, mwah, love oh you. My God. Da, da, da. And it's just like, <laughs> you're like, bitch, you don't fucking love me. You don't even know me. That's you hilarious. don't know me. That's so <laughs> weird because I literally, it's always kind of like the opposite with New York. It's like people in New York are so real. So I'm like shocked to hear you say that. But maybe Maybe it's just because I'm from London, though. But I think it also just depends. Like, I feel like if you're in the industry, you're obviously going to come across people that are like that. But I feel like if you just kind of separate yourself, you definitely can find some cool people that are just, like, chill. Yeah, like, not, like, trying to do too much or anything like that. But, you know, I kind of, I expect to meet those people that are also very, like, surface service level you know it's just i don't know it is what it is you've kind of been in the public eye for basically all of your life like how would you say that things have changed for you since social media has kind of been introduced because you've been working from before then how do you feel like it changed your career and also like changed your perspective on the industry it's weird because i think we obviously know the tool that social media can be and, you know, it can, it can help a lot of things. But I will say that I've had more conversations of me being like mad of what it's done <laughs> versus being happy. <laughs> when you start out in the music industry at that time that I did, it was just like, you know, early 2000s. Um, it was just about, it was, a, it was like a normal formula, which was like, mm -hmm. you know, Getting, getting your stuff out there on, like, you know, MTV music videos and, like, the 106 in Park play, like, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Like, you were just, like, it was, like, a normal thing. And, like, even, like, artist development was, like, more of a thing. And now it's very the opposite. Like, you don't have to do stuff like that, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Like, people are just being more authentically them, which is the part that I, I do like. Like, you're definitely more... Um, popular when you show your personality and I think versus back then it was more so just literally about the music which now is totally different like your personality is at the forefront like yeah and that's what's oh. gonna be like that's what's gonna be like what like drives it you know all the way through and it's just like such a weird concept and really it was hard for me to like get around that because I'm like normally a pretty private person because you kind of have to just like roll with the times. Trust me, you see me uploading all these TikToks and shit and they're like, ah, 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 and I'm like, oh my days, like, so people know that I'm not as serious as people think that I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, because every time I've seen you, you're like the most like, fun bubbly like outgoing person like every time i see you so that's hilarious that people would think that. <laughs> yeah but i don't i don't know i don't even know how to like translate it because i'm like sorry i don't have time to be doing vlogs tiktoks flip-flops uh this and that right. challenge i'm a savage yeah but i'm like oh my i can't keep right? up <laughs> it's so but, hard to keep up it makes me feel old and i'm like yo i'm not old so that that's like that's a dud like i'm not like <laughs> i'm not, not that but the thing is we're private people and i think that's something that we kind of relate to is the fact that i think where we started when we were younger as you said it was more about your work as opposed to your private life and all that other stuff so i like showing more my work and yeah um taking people along that journey but people want to see more of the back end of things which is like oh i'm like oh i kind of want to keep that to myself but mm -hmm. you know The official Prince podcast is back with a new season launching July 22nd. Welcome to America. I felt like the angels were there, like sitting with me. Every time he'd just point to me, I'd be like, oh, okay. You were kind of being pulled in a way that people normally would not be pulled. The story of Welcome to America from the Prince Estate. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. People call it a guilty pleasure. But what if I told you that reality TV is a time capsule of our culture? Queer Eye's Bobby Burke, The Circle's Chris Sapphire, and 90 Day Bay's Nicole Byer help me dissect our sometimes problematic faves. 
shows like The Bachelor, The Real World, and Survivor. From Neon Hum Media, Spectacle, an unscripted history of reality TV. Hosted by me, Mariah Smith. Subscribe now. What's up, beautiful people? This is your boy, Kirk Franklin. I'm here to tell you about a new project of mine called Good Words with Kirk Franklin. It's a podcast where I'll be having intimate conversations with celebrities, performers, and cultural leaders all around the intersection of pop culture and faith. And everyone's invited. So please subscribe to Good Words with your boy, Kirk Franklin, wherever you get your podcast and join your Uncle Kirk on this beautiful journey. Let's go. Hello there. David Tennant here, just popping in to let you know that I have a podcast. David Tennant does a podcast with. That's its actual title. On each episode, I sit down with some somebody interesting for a big old conversation, revealing conversations, surprising conversations, funny conversations. Over the last two seasons, I've had loads of amazing people. We've had Judy Dench, Jim Parsons, ooh, James Corden, Olivia Coleman, Jodie Whittaker, Michael Sheen, uh, Billy Piper, all sorts of people. Go and check it out. See who you can find. Catch up on seasons one and two now, wherever you get your podcasts. Dan Levy, Whoopi Goldberg, uh, Ian McKellen. Uh, oh, loads of them. When I first entered into the industry, I felt like it was my very first experience of like racism, colorism, all of that sort of stuff. I want to kind of talk about your first experiences of colorism and, you know, like how you navigated that because you were really young when you started in the industry. It was probably something that I had realized but didn't really know like the proper terms for it, didn't really understand how it wasn't just me going through it. Obviously, you know, I think one of our first introductions to just it in general and I guess race, colorism, all of it is like literally what we watch and like what we see. And even though I didn't see as many people that looked like me, it still didn't click during that time. I don't think it clicked till I was in school. And then it was, oh, this is a thing because people are like pointing it out in different ways. And it was like such like a ranking in like school with popularity and who the guys would actually like want to talk to. And almost it was just like very like trophy. Like this is who I like because it's it's going to make me look better and like more popular. Yeah, it was it was just like a weird thing. And 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 it was like people that I would date that were like just embarrassed to like say that they were dating me and I was just be like well I don't understand but you're paying <laughs> and that, for my American listeners peg means beautiful <laughs> what I can't even believe that I'm like are you mad very very weird thing to go through and think that they're right I literally thought that what they were saying it was oh I get it oh this is like it would be better if I was lighter and like have like this curly hair on my head and you know, had like these blue eyes, maybe like such a thing that I thought was fine. And I didn't see a problem with it until maybe, maybe around like 17, which was so late. Like, I think like during that time that you're like, I don't know. I just thought I was, I was smarter than that. I literally thought I was smarter than that. No, but it's not even about being smart though. It's because literally like nobody was really talking about it then. As you said, we didn't even know there was a name for what we were experiencing. We just thought it was normal. Yeah. I thought it was just completely normal when agents and stuff would be like to me, don't go into a casting after another black girl because they might get you guys confused, like stuff like that. And I would just be like, oh, okay. Like thinking that because they're adults as well, I was thinking that what they're telling me must be true. Right. Even back in school days, like being told, oh, yeah, you're pretty for a black girl. If I had to go with a black yeah. girl, I, I, I guess it would be you. The fact that we were taking that as like a compliment, because I would take it as a compliment. I would be like, oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Love like, that for me. <laughs> no. I feel like everybody had that, though, of like not understanding that actually that is yeah. so insulting. But to us, it was like, oh, rather that than them just being straight up like, oh, you're ugly, you're clapped, whatever, you know? Right. But 
Yeah. It takes time to learn these sort of things. And I definitely feel that the industries that we were in really perpetuated it. I even think that like, as far as being like in a group as well, I think in a weird way, people had uh, just a formula of how a group would work too, you know, and who would be in the forefront. And it was so odd because I loved Destiny's Child. Like I loved Beyonce. I loved Kelly. I loved Michelle. And it was because of them that literally, like, placed this, like, wide, like, universal, like, thing with labels that this is what works. This is what works. This this lighter skinned girl in the forefront. Um, and then the darker girl is either the third or second. So she's either, like, you know, being uh, the second best, essentially, you know. And it, it, it sucks so bad because I was looking at it as like a thing where, you know, everybody could be in the forefront and everyone could be the lead of something. Um, but I just realized when I was going through all the stuff with like different labels and music execs, who they wanted to be in the forefront was literally based off of who they felt was marketable. And, you know, it would be some people that would have this like, you know, insight of just feeling like that was like not right. So it was some people that were like, no, like it should be like, you know, this chocolate girl and, and, you know, like things were like different and like people don't usually like do stuff like that. So it was some people like that, but majority of it was very, this is what works. This should be the lead of this. This should be who is in the middle of this picture. This should be, it was just like the weirdest thing ever. And it, it bothered me for a very long time because I thought it, it was like no matter how hard I worked, no matter how like much I wanted it and how like even if I even if somebody was technically just working harder in general, it didn't matter because it was all about the look. And it continued for like a, a very long time, I think, in my career, just that like sort of mentality and going through stuff like that. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I completely relate though. I completely relate. And it is weird because in these industries, as you said, you can be the hardest worker. You can do everything like modeling. You can make sure you're, you're skinny, you're, you're, your skin's always clear, your hair's always X, Y, Z, your nails always clean, but it doesn't make a difference when people have their own perception of what should be on top. And they would always place mm -hmm. like people who look like us at the bottom and it was something that yeah. yeah and it did I completely understand and resonate with the fact that like that feeling of I wouldn't say it was like necessarily feeling like upset but that feeling of thinking like damn like what more can I possibly do to be able to yeah. get further in my career and where we've been working for from such a young age as well it kind of I feel like it might have like not fucked with us yet but it's like annoying because you feel like I've been working since I was 12 I've been working since I was 14 I should be able mm -hmm. to say that I'm where I am because of my hard work not oh because I'm dark skin I'm not going to be right. able to get further in my career. Do you know what I mean? Who would you say in your career, when you were feeling like this, who would you look up to then? Was there other dark-skinned women in the industry or outside of your industry that you looked up to who inspired you? Yeah, I mean, I definitely always looked up to Brandy since I was younger. I mean, she was like the one, like when I was watching television shows, watching Cinderella, listening to music. Like she was like right, right there and like killing it in like every aspect on like a global scale. So she was obviously somebody that I had always looked up to. What do you feel are some of the biggest differences between the music and acting industry then? Do you feel that acting was a little bit more of a level playing field? I definitely think they were similar in the way that they looked at black women. <laughs> the biggest difference with them is just more so in the way of, of how you can be creative. In the music industry, I always felt that I could be a bit more free. Uh, with just like how I speak, my personality, my style, like anything, it just felt more free and expressive. And with the acting industry, it can be a bit more like you have to kind of conform into something and not be too out there. 
because then people won't take you as serious. Mm -hmm. So it's always like me trying to find a very weird balance because I want to do both. So I, I, I don't know. It's, it's like so many different like aspects, but they're, they're similar in a lot of ways, but there's just like little things here and there that like make them different. And I, I just feel like I always have to move different in, in them. It's weird. <laughs> it's a lot, isn't it? When you're like wearing all these different hats Man. of like how to balance them on your yeah. head in the correct way, you know? It's, it's changing so much too, uh, that people are having more of an open mind with the fact that people do more than one thing. <laughs> but I think like back then it was like, okay, you're an actor, you're an actor. Okay, you're, an, you're a singer, that's what you are. And every time somebody stepped outside of that, it was like, what is this actress doing singing, you know, having a whole album come out? Or like, what is this like singer doing on this on this movie <laughs> that I'm watching? Like, it was like weird for people to like see stuff like that. And now I feel like people are just, oh yeah, like as humans, you can do more than one thing. Because you were actually cast to be Tiana in Empire, but you couldn't do it because of your contract with Def Jam, right? Was that one of the reasons why? Because they felt like they only wanted you to focus on music or was it something else? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, that. no, I was with, I think I was with Capital at that time. Those type of shows that involve music it, you're signed to another label as well once you go with them. So the fact that I was signed oh. to at that time, it was just like a big like conflict. And it was just, yeah. But it, it worked out for the better, I, I think, just because I think that Star fit me way more than Empire did. So um, it was just it was cool how it worked out. Now, for those of you who don't know, because you were living under a rock, <laughs> Ryan was in a TV show called Star. And it was perfect for you, right? Because it was following the lives of three young women who were trying to make it in the music industry. Talk me through just being on Star, being in another girl group dynamic again as well. Like, just talk me through that because that show to me, I loved it. I loved the, the topics that you guys touched on. I loved the acting, everything. So just talk to me about your time on set with Star. Yeah, Star was a crazy journey for me. And I think that everything that happens is just like, you know, a setup of what's going to happen next. So the fact that I was in a girl group, I think it was almost in a way to gear me up sort of to be in the show in a way. Like it, it seemed like it wasn't all for nothing. Like, you know, I, I got to like put in a little bit of what I knew and experienced into the show. Um, so that, that aspect was cool, but I was honestly, I was really scared to do star. I was like, I was, frightened I was freaking out when I when I felt that I had why it. it was because mainly because I just had gotten out of my group like I literally it was like probably like a few months in between where I was like okay like we're like officially gonna like part ways um so I was just kind of like in that zone you know I was like okay I I, I feel like I'm finally moving on to something that is best for me. I learned a lot about myself, um, what I'm capable of, uh, and what I need to work on. So it was just like, you know, it was just a big learning experience. So I'm just thankful for that. Here's a question. So when you're doing these sex scenes, <laughs> are you Ryan or are you Alexandra? <laughs> <laughs> because talk me through actually how do you film a, a sex scene please talk to me I need to understand how it works how many people in the room do you have like a practice kiss off stage like do you film yourself kiss beforehand so you know that your kiss looks good on camera like I need to understand <laughs> you know it's a really awkward thing like I definitely like that's like acting for sure because when you cut the cameras off like we're like splitting up I'm like wrapping myself up, being like quiet, being like to myself. Like I'm like, <laughs> it's such a weird thing. Now things have actually changed like more recently where people get, um, uh, what is it called? Cause I haven't had it yet, but they're basically like, um, choreographers for the sex scenes. Um, uh, 
oh. and they're kind of like they'd be like arch your back literally your back. but then it's a, Look yeah, yeah. Really? but like it's in a way where you know like everything is super like safe and you don't feel awkward mm. and it's literally for those moments where people can get a little weird and like touchy kind of make things form into real life so that's really why mm. they're there like it's to make things as like simple and like seamless and non-awkward and comfortable as possible i've experienced it where it's they're not there and it's just kind of like you're winging it and then people mm. are like telling like the director's like yelling telling you to do different stuff like as you're going and it's just like this is weird. Like, I just met this oh person. God. I don't know who this is. And this is just awkward. And I'm, like, half naked. And then there's, like, a whole crew of men behind the camera. And I'm just, like, this is so weird. I couldn't do that. It's weird. You really have Mate. to. It's really just, like, a, okay, this is, like, this means nothing. And this is a job. And everyone's professional. When everyone's professional, it makes it a lot easier. When you have, like, weird people on set, that's when it gets, like, Mm. that's when it gets weird yeah I like the sound of this choreographer thing because at least then you feel like I'm doing a routine yeah even though it's obviously a sex scene it's still a routine you kind of know what's coming Mm -hmm. you know what to expect okay so if I ever act I'm asking for this sex choreographer shit I might even ask (laughs) one right now you got any tips for me (laughs) if you had a daughter would you want her to enter into the industry as young as you have or what advice would you give to your daughter if she did want to follow in your footsteps Wow, that's a great question. Hmm. This is role model, baby. I'm not asking that every day. (laughs) I know, that's right. I always say that I, at the end of the day, would let my child, like, do whatever they feel. You know, things always change when you actually have a daughter. (laughs) And it's, like, real. It becomes really real. But I, I think that I would just, like, try to be as supportive and understanding of whatever she would want to do um even at a young age I think it's you know a way to express yourself so I would never want to minimize that in any way you know because beautiful things can come out of that and whether or not she falls in love with it or not you know it's just a part of the journey and I think when you're a parent and you try to stop something I feel like at a certain point they're gonna do it how they want to do it anyway at some point so you might as well just kind of be there and guide them as much as you can um I would definitely just like try to have her not go into the game as naive as I did like I would I would I would try and pray I really I always look at like there's so many people like that are really really young right now and doing so many amazing things and I'm like Yo, I was not like that at 16. Like, I wish I was, but I was not. So I would love, (laughs) I would love if like my daughter was sort of more like that. A little, a little, you know, more advanced than me. I get it. I have a lot of questions from your fans here. I was going through it. (laughs) Of course, all of them obviously want to know what can they expect from you this year? Like music, film, like when they can expect something new. Tell us. Yeah. Um, So with the film side, I actually had to stop filming uh, my movie Flint Strong uh, right before the pandemic happened it would have been done by now but it's not Mm. so I have to start that back up in January Um, so really excited for it but it has been a very very long process with this whole pandemic stuff (laughs) so yeah so I'm really really excited for that Um, my music I've been (laughs) my fans hate me because I'm always saying something and then they're always like this means nothing because she said this before. Like, I'm always like, very, you're fake. <laughs> yes. I'm always very, like, vague with my answers. I'm like, you know, it's soon. I'm recording. But I literally have, like, I don't want to tell them, like, a month. And then, like, I something. I get their hopes up and they yeah, change. Yeah. And then something gets delayed or something, you know. But um, I'm really excited. There's definitely going to be, like, uh, music videos uh, put out this year. And a project is my plan. Um But definitely, visually, you will see more stuff drop this year. My last question from Onika Destiny. 
If you could choose one song to describe your life as a whole, what would your song be? Oh my God, that's hard. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I always say my one, I always say is um, Ja Rule, Living It Up. I definitely, like, Return of the Mac is definitely, like, one of my songs where I'm like that. Oh. Yes. Okay, I love that. It just that. feels so good. I love what it's saying, and, yeah, it's just a really fun song. Thank you, Ryan. We're coming on Role Model. Tune in, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and that is a wrap. Yes. <laughs> Role Model is a Something Else production, produced by Harriet Wells. Additional production from Steve Ackerman. The executive producers are Claire Solon and Chris Skinner. Special thanks goes to Ellen McLeod, Charlotte Tahira, Camilla Baden, Jesse Donnelly, Emma Lansden, and Mark Rivers. Next time on Role Model. All throughout my teens, I was like, the math's just not mathing. <laughs> <laughs> something's off and I didn't know what it was and at first I thought oh okay I'm I'm gay or maybe it's because I'm black and gay that I feel so weird about being gay mm. and then I was like mm, something's just not right and I thought that I was gay because I was in the body that I was in and I liked other bodies that look like my body so I thought okay I'm gay and then I transitioned and then I was like okay well I can't say that I'm gay anymore because I'm attracted to the opposite sex, I guess. And mm -hmm. then I started having feelings for people that looked like my body. Um, <laughs> and then I was like, okay, well, I need to explore this. And then I did. And then I was like, well, I guess that I'm not straight or gay. I guess I'm just going to stop trying to define myself.